Hi, so I'm Nicole. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist out of Buffalo, New York. Um, and I incorporate all things geeky into my therapy uh, and Stranger Things has been the topic for the past couple of weeks. So it's uh, been a lot of fun. Brent. So I'm Brent, I'm a registered mental health counseling intern that's paying boards right now for becoming fully licensed. I am also a geek therapist, uh, blending that with experiential therapy, which is what I specialize in. And this week I was helping assist some clients in treatment with binge watching A Stranger Things and having topics on it. So definitely excited. And then I will actually apologize for the fact that I don't remember if it's Andrea or Andrea. It's Andrea? It's Andrea. Yeah. Okay, no, I did. Okay. okay, it is the one I remembered. Um, but I am not a psychologist. Uh, I'm what are a, you doing here? I know, right? I'm a super <laughs> fan of of Stranger Things, um, but I teach digital media as well. So I teach audio and photography and uh, all things media. So I guess that's what qualifies me to be here and talk with all you big brainiacs from the psychology side of things. Yeah, in the books we work on, we, we've got a number of non-psychologists and, and non-counselors who co-author with us, because I think the perspective is very important. Since we're writing books to teach the world about psychology, it's good to have the perspective of somebody who's not wrapped up in the psychology jargon uh, for the other perspective and for sometimes us to realize, oh yeah, this not everybody knows what cognitive dissonance is or some such thing. Hey, Wind, person who has successful social psychology in many, many other books. The, the one person in this bunch who has contributed to more popular culture psychology books than I have, because you were writing a, for some of these books back in 2006. Who are you? Thanks for having me. Um, oh, there's Andrea's cat. Uh, I, I'm a psychology professor here in Iowa. I'm a social psychologist, so not having to do with therapy or counseling or mental health as much as social dynamics between people. And Andrea and I have co-authored a chapter for the Stranger Books thing, Stranger Things book <laughs> on um, the psychology of friendships and the friendship network that we see highlighted throughout the series. So I'm excited to be here and contribute to this one. Right. Alex. I am a Wall Street investor who lost millions of dollars in <laughs> Surfer Boy Pizza and now I'm currently living in a van uh, down by the river. No, no. Uh, I too am a psychologist. I am a social psychologist, the author of the Geek Handbook series of Make a Nerdy Living, uh, uh, the graphic novel Kill the Freshman, and a, there's my kid. Hi, Spencer. Hi, <laughs> <Hi>, Spencer. <laughs> Opposite, hi. Uh, and I am, all, he's waving hi. You can't quite see it. Uh, I am also a contributor to Stranger Things Psychology. Uh, on a chapter on masculinity, both positive and toxic. So for th those of you who um, have written for the book, Stranger Things Psychology, Life Upside Down, before we get into our season four debrief, what did you write about? I already mentioned uh, the chapter Andrea and I co-authored is about friendship theory and sort of adolescent friendships in particular. Um, and so research on common sort of dynamics that we see in adolescent relationships and then how those play out in the series. Andrea, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, and of course there's all kinds of complex layering that happens. Um, we did focus on adolescent friendship, but of course, I mean, you can look at it from so many different layers in the show. Um, the adult layer, the high school going to college level um, and, and the adolescence, there's a lot of interesting dynamics that are that sort of cross lines across all of them really. So it was, it was really fun to take a look at it all. And since we wrote most of the book before season four and now we've got to go back and fit some season four into it. Uh, well, we were originally trying to be able to get it out before this season, but then a publisher um, made us an offer to distribute it wider. Of course, we took that. Um, but we've got some season four stuff to fit in. And it, it occurs to me, I'm thinking about your chapter, because your chapter is the first one in the book. Um, Max gets saved by friendship in episode four. Uh, 
I mean, yeah. we, we talk about how the Kate Bush song saves her, but her friends are there fighting and, and, and at other times too, but repeatedly throughout the show, people are doing things out of friendship, but uh, with Max, her connections to others are critical in pulling her back. Absolutely. And um, so much of what you see in the flashbacks of sort of that, think about the happy stuff, right? When, when they're constantly sort of think about the things that really matter to you, both for Al and for Max, you see just all of the sort of joyful friendship moments uh, that happened. And, and that is actually how Elle ends up pulling her back from the brink of death. It we occurred, hope. A tangent just occurred to me. Uh, you may, you reminded me of the last episode of um, Ben Ken Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, I don't guess I should throw in Obi Wan Kenobi spoilers. I'll just do my own rant, comment, and then edit it out if I remember to edit it out, uh, <laughs> or skip thirty seconds ahead to avoid Ben Kenobi spoilers. Um, at at the end, when he's fighting Darth Vader, uh, he's got he's thinking of some of the things that are needed, but it's not till he remembers actual bonds with people, especially the two little kids, uh, that he's able to fight back and, and survive that battle himself. And there are definitely some of those moments. I think there's I think there's definitely a parallel with what goes on with Max in particular in Stranger Things. And they do make plenty of uh, Star Wars references and sometimes compare Elle's powers to using the Force. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I love that episode. I mean, I, I, I love this whole season. That, that fourth episode in particular is one that I would, I would absolutely describe as one of the best episodes of anything I've ever seen because it, it so nicely ties together a good story and a good adventure with metaphor that can be unpacked because you've got you've got Vecna as this in a lot of ways among other things a representation of things like self-isolation things like depression things like suicidal ideation and then you've got Max who has been like Vecna's previous victim sleep slipping further and further into depression into her self-isolation and the way she comes back from that is by focusing on some of her happiest memories focusing on the positive aspects of her life and by the unyielding efforts of the people in her life to support her. Lucas has like in back-to-back -back episodes, he has these great speeches with her where he's like, please just talk to me. Like, and he, he's trying so hard to reach out to her. And then at the next episode, he, he apologizes. He's like, he's like, I should have done more. You know, he gives, he gives an almost Oscar Schindler-esque speech where he's like, I should have done more, you know? Cause he, he was still, he was trying his hardest and yet he still blames himself for not working harder to try to save her. And, uh, but ultimately, you know, in that sequence he does. And it's just, again, it's a brilliant melding of story and metaphor and real psychology into that. And I loved it, especially too, because when Vecna has Max in the upside down, he tells her, you know, there's a reason that you hide from them. And it's because you know that you belong here. And, you know, so she's isolating from her family. She's isolating from her friends in a way that's almost her being in the upside down without physically being in the upside down. Because, you know, as we go on and we learn that Vecna consumes his victims whole, they stay with him. You know, he's consuming all of those negative emotions, that grief, that guilt, that trauma, all of that. And it's almost like that's what's fueling the upside down. And so, in him telling her that you belong here it's almost you know saying like because of all of that like you are part of this and it's it was nice to see that it was you know everybody's saying oh it's music that heals the broken mind but it really was that bond of friendship that really allowed her to escape yeah because it wasn't it wasn't that it was any song it had to be a song that held a significance to her yeah similar with 11 when throughout season four she's trying to decide am i a villain or am i a hero right and the the label and the stigma that that can come um that can come with the label the sort of self-fulfilling prophecy if you decide i'm a bad person that's the that's the path I'll, I'll continue to go down and it's the friendship that really um brings both of them back and mike you know reaching out to Elle while she's fighting and and you know saying you know remember 
we're the heart, remember, you know, the friendship. So for both of them, it's, it's the sort of empowerment that, that they decide that they're in control of who they are and what they want their future to be. And I think th that, that, I'm oh, sorry, dad, you can go ahead. Well, just on, on what she said about, um, even though it is very important that the friends are involved, the friendship plays a crucial role in helping her. It's just helping her. Yeah, because when just hit on is like ultimately it's Max who saves herself. And you saw hints of that starting to happen earlier than these sort of penultimate moments that we've talked about. Because um, in the in the episode where she's she sort of realized that she's next on the list, she's next to die. Um, and she's preparing for that. What does she do? But she reaches out and writes letters to everyone who matter, who matters to her. And she goes and reads that letter to Billy at his grave, um, sort of seeking some sort of connection. And I think in the case of Billy, forgiveness, uh, that I'm not sure she needed to ask for, but that's a different issue. Um, but the whole point here is that, you know, Max was, Max was beginning at that point herself, even though she wasn't quite there with opening up to Lucas and others to re realize, okay, these people all matter to me. I've got to do something mm -hmm. uh, to reconnect. And she has her guilt with uh, each of these people that uh, Vecna is preying on. They all have guilt related to somebody else's death. It's not just survivor guilt. Sur survivor guilt, feeling guilty for surviving when somebody else did not. They, they each feel that they, they should have done something differently or should have done something at all in, in all those cases. And that plays into these feelings that he's preying on for, is it because that's really what he needs or just that's what he wants? Or that's what he understands. Because there's a point where you know, I, I can't remember who said it, but somebody saying that like, that he only, oh, I think Max even says it maybe, that he only understands the negative, you know, like Max gets away from, she's escaping him uh, in the finale by going into her happy memories because he just, he cannot wrap his head around that. So I think also he's able to prey on these people because the bad stuff is all he can understand. He's kind of like the quintessential sociopath, right? Like when you when he talks, you hear it. Like he doesn't care about any sort of connection. He doesn't care about his family. There was nothing about friends. He manipulated L into releasing him, mm -hmm. and I, I think that that's too. That's what he latches onto um, because again, I think that that's what fuels him as well. And what and he he gets that that whole predator prey analogy that he constantly makes. That's why he loved the upside down so much and said it's unspoiled by mankind. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt that by that he meant we don't have any of the the love, the light, any of that here. It's just survival. Yeah, when he says he would be a predator for good, I wasn't even sure what does he mean by that? Because he's not good, doing good for any other people. So this yeah, it's fascinating. Up, yes. It's fascinating um, with a the theme that's coming up with the suffering with Vecta feeding off of it with his own uh, unresolved traumas. And it's like he takes on the this identity of this predator so he can just own the suffering itself. And if I'm going to be suffering, then those around me are going to suffer as well. And we see um, Max just kind of doesn't do this. She's battling that with this internal conflict that's happening. But deep down inside, here she is doing experiential type of work where she's writing letters. And not only that, but she's allowing herself to see a different perspective from Billy's perspective while still honoring her own traumas and her pain. And I think it does a beautiful way too with the power of music, um, especially uh, within the season and her using that as a way to, for her to ground herself in the here and now and then allowing that music to access these uh, memories of friendship and connection and allows her to, I think, establish these safe anchors again with her friends back again, which really pulls her out of it. And not only that, but teaches them the, the importance of, of the connection that they have with friendship and this fellowship that they have. 
think it's interesting that I think it's really cool that that song has, from the eighties by Kate Bush has been number one on iTunes. Know what number two has been? Master of Puppets. Master of Puppets by Metallica. <laughs> yes, and that's um, gonna. I guarantee you that's gonna go to number one. I hope so. I hope yeah. so too. Yeah, it, it, it's made it to number two, beaten by you know, Kate Bush. So Stranger Things has put two songs from the 80s at number one and number two on iTunes. Finally, that indie band Metallica can get the big break they've been hoping for for so long. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it worked wonders for that, uh, you know, not so well-known band that had the song that became a theme for Peacemaker. You know, maybe it'll help Metallica get a, yeah, a, hey. a new manager and so forth like it did for them. Yeah, yeah. revive their career. We just acknowledge while we're on the topic, yes. what an epic guitar solo Eddie gave us. Yes. Oh yeah, and, I mean, oh and my god! One of my best friends is a, I would argue, master guitarist. And when he was watching it, naturally, his fingers, he, they go to the frets, they go to the chords, and he was like, "That guy, I mean, he might have been miming it, but he was miming the right notes." So, uh, kudos to Joseph Quinn for playing Master Puppets correctly. So, Travis, can I can I pose a question to the group? Absolutely. This is something that Andrea and I were discussing um, just among the two of us. Um, so let's talk about Eddie's. This is like, no spoilers are okay, right? People have watched the show. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the title <laughs> of this is going to say a uh, season <laughs> four debrief. So, right. you know. Okay, so Eddie's death. Eddie, what? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. He so, went to a coma. Dustin didn't know better. Certainly. Eddie's death served a personal purpose for Eddie in his being able to reclaim kind of saying, I didn't run away this time, mm -hmm. right? Um, we see this very poignant scene where Eddie's um, uncle, right, is told he died a hero. Okay, but in terms of the plot of actually fighting Vecna, did Eddie's death serve a purpose? Did him drawing the bat monsters away sort of for 30 seconds actually do any good or was his death kind of a waste i i had the same conversation with somebody too and because he drew those bats away we don't know what would have happened had he not done that because for all we know those bats could have swarmed the house and you know torn the crap out of steve again and you know and torn into everybody yes so i mean we we don't know we have to we have to assume that it was a sacrifice worthwhile because well, several of them survived by, you know, seconds. Yes. So he probably bought just enough time to save several of them, especially Max. Because yeah. if if Elle had, you know, jump-started her heart, you know, by remote control uh, any later, you know, Mac, Max's, you know, body wouldn't still be alive. Uh, but those were, I mean, we had th the, th the three teenage, the older teens who were getting strangled by vines. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I couldn't help but think that same question too, though. So I've run this through my head a few times. Yeah, like, same. Okay. I think he bought them just enough time mm -hmm. yep. to save I, several of their lives. I, it's the only way I can accept the yeah. death. And, and I'm still not terribly accepting of the death anyway. Um, and I have high hopes that there's going to be a crazy twist in five and Eddie is going to come back. Did you hear the theory of how they want to bring that people think he's going to come back? I did hmm. not. I, I'm weird about that. And I don't, I was telling Wynn this the other day, I don't read that stuff ahead because I don't like things to be spoiled. Okay. okay. So well, regardless of that, there's room. I mean, it's like he's yeah. lying there looking dead. Of course, Max was dead. Um, and hey, for all we know, those bats just anesthetize people. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, Steve Steve got pretty ripped into, and then he was fine. He was perfectly fine. He wasn't he, taking on five hundred of them, though. Despite, no, he wasn't. Despite Robin Robin's fear of of rabies, so who knows? <laughs> rabies still may be on the table too. Yeah, my 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 one thought on that is like we've also got to get Max back. Yes, yeah. uh, I, I think Vecna's got her psyche, soul, or whatever in one of those trees. He's got the three dead ones. And so they've got to get her back from the upside down. Well, not the, the psychic upside down, the in, the, the in between, limbo, whatever. Um, recovering two of them seems a bit much to hope for. Yeah. So yeah. Andrea and I also have our own personal 
<laughs> in theory on the max death because I was sort of, I know I'm going to sound very heartless, okay, but I was sort of complaining like it felt sort of cheap to me to kill Max and then oh, she's not really dead. Like I, I felt like it was sort of, like I said, kind of cheap, like, you know, oh, uh, Dumbledore's dead or Dumbledore's gay, but he's not really gay until after I published the book to make a billion dollars. Like, so I, it seemed a little maybe hypocritical to me or something, but Andrea has a really good theory for why she maybe is half dead. So Andrea, do you want to share your theory? <laughs> um, help me recall all the stuff I talked about while we were drinking wine. So, <laughs> so Vecna needed four deaths, right? So you could right. open the yeah. gate. That's my theory. The yeah. Intersection where the upside down comes into. Right. So right my now. thought was that if Max died, even for a short period of time, but then is that's that process of dying is stopped. Then to the last scene where they walk out onto the field and you see the, the upside down, the gates opening uh, in front of you. You know that they got far enough that the four kind of counted to sort of open all four, but the process of dying didn't go all the way or it was brought back from the brink. Therefore, the possibility of being able to close things still exists. Um, L's still, L and probably will still have a way to turn this because the process of the death was stopped when it was. And I think the the book that Lucas was reading at the end, The Talisman by Stephen King, I think that's going to play a role as well, because if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the premise of the book was about somebody who could navigate two different dimensions. Yeah, that's exactly right. I read that book. Kind of a, Stephen King's sort of a weird choice to read somebody in a coma, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I say I think Weird choice. Yeah. <laughs> He, he knows Max loves that stuff. He knows Max loves that book. Max, Max, given her background, she probably had three books in her room. And so Lucas probably got them all and is probably just cycling through them. And hey, the talisman is about is about somebody getting back from another world and mm -hmm. finding their way back. So, that, so. that actually made me think, God, it's been a hundred years since I've read that book. I need to go back and reread it. So moving back into our psychology. Hey, Alex, what's your chapter about? Uh, my chapter is on masculinity, both toxic and positive in Stranger Things. And since we talked about Eddie, I just want to talk about him in relation to uh, masculinity because, you know, Eddie is such a fascinating character because when he is first presented to us, it is in such an over-the-top way that to some people, it's a turnoff. A friend of mine who I was trying to get to watch this, this season, because she was a little lukewarm on season three, and I was like, you really got to watch season four. And she's like, all right. And then she watches the first episode. She's like, Eddie, it's just so tiresome to me. And I'm like, it's for a reason. Just stick with it. And then after watching it, she's like, oh, okay, I see where it was all going. Um, and Eddie, you know, ultimately, like, the thing that he does more than anything, the thing he's focused on more than anything, is, like, looking out for the other little weirdos. You know, so one of the last things that he says to Dustin is to make him promise, to repeat the promise, to watch out for the sheep, meaning the other little weirdos at the school, to take care of them. Because he gives that great speech to Mike and Lucas. Hold on, Spence, can you not stand right behind me? Okay. All right. He gives this great, Eddie gives this great speech to Mike and Lucas about, or not Mike and Lucas, Mike and Dustin about like, if Lucas can't play D&D, &D, then you go out and find somebody else who will because I'm about to graduate. This is finally my year. Ugh. And, uh, and you know, to take care of them the way that he tried to take care of, of uh, Mike and Dustin. Mm -hmm. And so I just love that, like, Eddie is, is such a, uh, he's such a good older brother figure, as is Steve uh, as well. I mean, Steve, we've seen, we've had several seasons of Steve being a good older brother, babysitter, what have you. Uh, then I also love that when, when we finally get those two guys kind of together and conversing and they both talk about like liking, you know, to look out for Dustin 
and you know a lot of lesser shows would have had the two of them kind of butt heads like well i'm the better older brother well i'm the better older. instead it was more of them just being like hey, so i'm not dusted i just kind of like him yeah he's just you just kind of want to watch out for the kid yeah 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 so i love that camaraderie between him and steve that they both acknowledge like yeah there's just something about dustin you want to watch out for the guy and kind of help him out even though he can be uh extremely pedantic <laughs> a little bit jealous of each other right at the beginning um but they they get over that pretty quickly yeah they get over it very fast to realize i i stereotyped you i thought you were going to be a certain type of person now that i'm getting to know you i realize you know we're we're more similar than we are different and i, I love that moment where they kind of realize that mm -hmm. but they yeah, definitely do not so listen to the moments. same music no <laughs> how did steve not know about ozzy biting the head off a bat Steve, listen, when Steve was trying to think of Back to the Future, he described it as that movie with Alex P. Keaton. He is very, very pop culture oblivious. <laughs> there are so many great moments, too, though, picking up on what you said, Wind, of people discovering how limited those stereotypes actually are. Um, you know, Robin goes through that with Nancy right uh quite a little bit um i feel like yeah, definitely eddie and steve even if you, you could make the argument jonathan and steve have have done it there's so many sort of moments where you see okay well, my stereotype of you is just not it's not accurate it's not there um they did a great job with that especially this season mm -hmm. so with um the friendship between Hopper and the Russian guard guy, right? Like, oh, right. That's another one. That's another they, really good example. They bond over how the fact that they're really pretty similar in those ways. Mm -hmm. Both parents, both trying to navigate this weird thing that is parenting, right? Yeah. I couldn't help but think, because calling him Enzo, it reminded me of Enzo's, where somebody was supposed to have a date but then he gets supposed you know supposedly killed but he's actually in russia and then uh max and lucas making plans to go to a movie yeah if do you're not in a stranger ask... things adventure do not make plans for a date during the adventure no you're wait, in trouble wait till after wait till after definitely not during the adventure it's just a recipe for disaster yeah 50 percent of you you know, will wind up, uh, you know, seemingly dead or dead like yeah. um, until the, the next season. So don't do it. So the strategy is make a date with Vecna and hope that he ends up dead. Now that's the big brain move. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Good call. We're talking about the positive masculinity, we didn't get to see Mr. Clark this season. Yeah, this was our first Mr. Clarkless season. With this, this is such a big season, and yet there was no Mr. Clark. Who, uh, you know, going through all the Stranger Things, looking for examples of positive and negative masculinity. Like Mr. Clark really grew on me because he is yeah. just he acts as such a good mentor to uh, to the boys and to everyone. In season three, when Joyce comes up with science questions, he's just he's just happy to talk science. He's not trying to like hit on Joyce. He's not talking down to her. He doesn't talk down to the kids either. He is just happy to have someone interested in science the way that he is. Mm -hmm. They're just really not in school in this season. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, they weren't in season three either. They, you know, they just popped by his house with a science question, but you no, know, Mr. Clark, I'm, I'm hoping for a big triumphant Mr. Clark return in season five. So I'm, I'm curious, too, about yes. giving your chapter. I'm very curious about your take on the basketball team. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, first of all, kudos to the actor who plays lead psycho. Uh, I don't actually know his name, but just kudos to that actor because he plays him with such a barely restrained and often not restrained, like unhinged fury and uh to him so just it's an absolutely great performance um but you know about chrissy's boyfriend <laughs> yes yeah. chrissy's boyfriend the lead guy jason yeah i think it might be jason it's jason i can't uh, but the, so the basketball team stranger things one of the areas in which it is very very unsubtle is when it comes to bullies 
the bullies in Stranger Things are always these huge, like larger than life kind of bullies. We see it with the girl who's bullying Elle in this season, where it is as over the top as it can possibly be. And the second that girl starts bullying Elle, you get a hundred people all standing around watching. You see the same thing in the, the first season with the two guys who are bullying the boys. Um, and with the basketball team, they're still, they very much hit into the, the negative stereotypes of, of your jocks. Uh, and he is the, the cult leader of the jocks to where everybody is just listening to him. He goes to you know, a town meeting and takes the microphone and everybody's listening to him rather than the sheriff, which by, you know, if Hopper had been around, he would have told that kid to shut up and sit down. But uh, you know, the seeming new police chief was not, he just didn't have, I guess, the gumption to tell that kid to sit down and shut up. But I, I thought it was interesting uh, for Lucas's arc to be him flirting with what is a the stereotypical idea of what he should be doing and to ultimately realize that that's not who he wants to be. And I think it gets summarized so well in that interaction with him and Jason at the end where Jason's like, you know, I should have never let you into the door. And Lucas is like, I shouldn't have knocked. Mm -hmm. It's a great line. Mm -hmm. there, yeah. there are people who in real life will try to live up to stereotypes. And then we don't want to overgeneralize to all jocks, all of any particular group, but you will see it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you will see people who are doing these things. I mean, again, Steve is a jock. We don't really see him playing much sports, but like he, it is referenced frequently. He was captain of the basketball team. He was captain of the swim team. Like he was an athletic guy, but we mostly see him as uh, with four seasons and we've most, mostly seen him as cool babysitter, Steve. I mean, we, we do see him, we do see him uh, practicing basketball uh, when uh, Billy's, uh, going back flirting. and forth on is he is he flirting with steve or what yeah yeah um, oh, so it, it, there's something you pointed out if you go through all the characters who's the only character billy is ever nice to in any moment steve i re-watching looking again for those masculine interactions steve his interactions with steve i mean they get into fist fights and stuff too but he also there's this weird like Billy trying to kind of be nice with him and trying to offer advice about being the new big man in town. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting interaction. I, I, I think Billy might've been wrestling with the sexuality. And I think that, I think that King Steve was his, his means of wrestling with that sexuality. Billy's nice to Chrissy. I think he's nice to Dustin. No, no, Billy, uh, Max's brother. Oh, God, of course. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no. Eddie's nice to lots of people. <laughs> I was, thinking of Eddie. I was yeah. like, you guys are being silly. We've got Eddie. Eddie but, as sorry. Dustin points out, Eddie never got angry. They never I got know. angry. Even when he should have. Well, he's nice to um, Melts. I mean, he's, he has a little bit of niceness here and there, but the most consistent niceness was with Steve, who we also competed with and gets in a fist fight with. It's a very strange. Well, it's interaction when, i wish we would had more of a chance to have more of it because... other when other than when billy turns on the fake charm right right okay right. Uh, other than when he turns on the fake charm because you know he was you know definitely capable of doing that eddie haskell kind of stuff and i'm going real old school on that reference uh, so what this particular season is Vecna a good metaphor for depression? I see a lot of writers referring to Vecna as a metaphor for depression. I see Nicole nodding. That's, what do y'all think? I, I think that, I think it, it, in trauma as well, again, um, that he's a good metaphor for that because there's something I, that Dr. Brenner says, I can't remember which episode it was, but when he talks about when Vecna consumes somebody, he says he consumes everything that they were, everything that they are, and everything that they will be, which I feel is like a great metaphor for depression because it's really like kind of how it is. It consumes everything about you. Um, and again, he just kind of forces you to relive the worst moments of your life and keeps you there. And it almost feels, and there is really no escape. And it, it wasn't until Max, you know, kind of, mustered up the courage to be able to escape herself that you be you're able to see like how other things can help you cope with it and get you out of it but i i do feel like he is just like this all-encompassing suffocating type of being that i feel is a great representation for depression i agree and and uh to to go back to our discussion earlier saying about vecna uh, 
only sees the negative and only understands the negative. I mean, very often when we're experiencing depression, we can only see the bad, you know, we can't see the good, we become blinded to it. And I think, again, that ties really well into Vecna as this metaphor for depression. Yeah, when the person is in, you know, deep, dark depression, it's hard for them to see the things that would be the most helpful for them. It is hard for them to do the things that would be the most helpful. Like we talked to a suicidal extreme, which, you know, these characters may not have wanted to die, but most suicidal people don't actually want to die. You know, they want the pain to end, and that's different. Uh, but the, the depression clouds the point of view for them to see some of the things that would help them get past it. I hate using the phrase get past it. That sounds like, uh, we're just, oh, just leave it behind. It's, no, it's more like the heel. Max, to recover. Max survives episode four, and she still has a battle ahead of her. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also true to issues such as depression. And There's he- also the stuckness that's there too with the trauma, right? Nicole was bringing that up as well. Is depression can you know has association with trauma itself, and we were mentioning before with the, uh, this grief and loss theme uh, that takes place with a lot of the characters, and I just see it just you know Vecta just represents the stuckness of pain and suffering and not knowing how to get out of it where if it's anxiety or depression or a mental health condition or these um life stressors or unresolved traumas i mean we see that with max we see that with billy for instance though you know last season um we you know you see a different component of of billy you you almost see l connecting uh almost in this version of like uh this empty chair where she's like in his head and she sees his viewpoint and, you know, Bill gets this opportunity where he kind of like flips that a little bit uh, at the end for Max and stuff. And you, then you get to hear his story a little bit. And you're like, oh, my gosh, it's just pain re, uh, resurfacing over and over again, that transgenerational trauma. He gets abused by his father and he's abusing Max. And then it's like it, it's spiraling out of control at this point. So stuck in this to me, I've always used with clients and patients a lot of times of is how do we get you unstuck of the depression or the anxiety or the trauma that's there? For for those of you who are therapists, how does talking about something like Stranger Things have any place in counseling dialogues? So for me, especially with this season, you know, again, with the geek therapist also piggybacking off of like superhero therapy that Janina Scarlett, uh, her work, um, we're always battling monsters, right? So we're battling our demigorgons, our demidogs, demibats, our vecnas. Um, and again, you know, you being able to use that metaphor of like vecna being, you know, the figurehead for depression or the figurehead for trauma um, and having to learn like, how do we battle him? How do we defeat him? Um, when he tells Max, you know, you belong here, you know, you belong here. Um, basically kind of being like a metaphor for, you know, you're already here. You're, you just, you know, I believe he tells every single one of his victims, like it'll be over soon. Um, but having the ability to get through it, you know, yes. Okay. She, she has the Kate Bush song, but it was more than that. There was more coping skills that she was able to use to be able to escape the upside down. So I use it as like, okay, so we're in it now, you know, Vecna has us, we got to learn to not, to not let him consume us, to be able to escape the upside down. What can we do that's positive in our lives to be able to escape the negativity that is the upside down. Um, And my clients can really, especially those that are big Stranger Things fans can really relate to that. And they're like, okay, so I need to defeat Vecna. How do I defeat Vecna? Brent, you have thoughts on this? Yeah, it's it's interesting. The first thing that came to my mind while I was hearing uh, Nicole speak is uh, this this voice that a lot of us have and identifying what that voice is. Uh, when I'm doing experiential therapy with my clients and from the trauma lens, I'm trying to teach them that like that voice is not really theirs. It's like a it, it's compartmentalized in so many different voices that they've experienced over the years, uh, wherever it was um invalidation or how they saw the world or these stereotypes like dr travis was mentioning before 
Um, so it's just, it's fascinating where we can use that language to help clients of being like, okay, well, this sounds like, you know, Vecta's living in your head and stuff. What, what can we do as effective coping skills, right? Like your utility belt, like your Batman utility belt, what can we do? Breathing, what about connection to other people? What we do opposite action, which is a DBT skill set, dialectal behavioral therapy, um, to be able to get out of that uh, that state or in that that mood that's being pre present. Um, so I, I think it's exploring using those metaphors are very powerful um, with people and they get that. And I, I always love the intersection between uh, popular culture and psychology because it allows us to tap into things with this uh, symbolism and this metaphors that a lot of people can relate to. A lot of people die in stranger things. There's a lot of death. There's some gruesome death. And there you got piles of people dying and merging into one thing in the previous season. Basketball boy gets burned Cut in half. In half. Woo! Just burnt. Yowza. Like, How well, many times did we have to watch the massacre at the facility of all those children i mean we yeah. watched it i how many times like a dozen times it must have come up in various flashback scenes yeah yeah i wasn't sure we needed that at the beginning of the season either either even if they'd already shot it we had just had real life issues too as i know he's setting up to make make you wonder did l do all this i'm not sure they needed to show all of that to make to do that though um it's, but it, it, it was important on this issue of Elle wondering if she's hero or villain mm -hmm. to make us wonder it a little too. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, what was she trying to do to that girl with her powers in front of everybody? Was she d d trying to blast her head apart for having been mean to her? Mm -hmm. Hard to say. Maybe, maybe she was just going to make her pee your pants too. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah she, she split the girl's face with an ice skate which in, in real life yeah you know, it's like that's not you're not gonna get off easily so everybody goes oh they humiliated you so you split their face open with an ice skate no i mean it was understandable l doing it because she was not raised in a uh she was raised in an environment which rewarded her for you know lashing out aggressively and so she still has to like learn to do so appropriately um but yeah in real life no no not okay we're already approaching the hour uh, so i want to get into uh so what's what, what's positive what's wonderful about the show it's um so it goes well the, the, the two chapters we've talked about you know friendship and positive masculinity you know are very very important things uh, very important especially the friendship issue all throughout the show and and this season for all the things that have happened and l being down about having lost a fight uh, when, when she's not used to ever having lost um what do they get uh, for them to feel good and feel hopeful and about a uh, life at all there at the end of the season any of them well the reunion of hopper and l at the end is so uplifting to me um I loved that scene. I, I felt like I had waited all season for that scene. And um, it totally gave me everything I wanted in that scene. So for me, that was hugely uplifting. And, and she didn't even look surprised. And she didn't know he was coming because the phones were knocked out by the town being ripped into, you know, drawn, the town being drawn and quartered. Um, yeah. Yes, but she didn't look that surprised. So when she said she believed it, it seemed very real. Um, mm -hmm. That was that uh, Robin maybe getting a girlfriend finally. With Anne of Green Gables, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> although one thing I've noticed, I mean, Robin is a great character, but in what we've got so far in, in the current draft of the book, almost every reference to Robin is about her coming out, which yeah, had, had been my, my favorite scene in, in, in all of the show. But it was her and Steve talking uh, when uh, when she does have that moment, and okay, it throws him for a second, but he's just as much her friend as ever. Um, and well, I, there was a lot less Robin to go on when most of the chapters were being written. You know, there, there was less of of her. Although yeah. that that 
was almost the end of the season though that mm-hmm. moment was the next to last episode we, we, we'd really enjoyed robin before then as this this cool smart although she can be a little too talkative and they made a whole lot more of that this season apparently that's because that's the actress what she does when she's nervous and they built it into the character more mm-hmm. well and also you know last in the third season we see her primarily around steve and a couple of little kids from her perspective and then this season she's hanging around nancy a lot so i also think robin is just being extra nervous being around a pretty girl <laughs> Hmm. and the, one of the one of the popular kids yep. you know one of the ones that she thought of as such a press who mm-hmm. keeps surprising she just keeps surprising people with her firearms yeah <sighs> yes mm-hmm. that was your question about what's good about the show and sort of what have we get out of especially maybe this season my favorite scene in the entire season was when Jonathan and Will are talking and Jonathan says to Will, you know, I love you no matter what. And it's okay yeah. to come and talk to me and you're always mm-hmm. my brother. And yeah. That, yeah. that got me in the feels. Yeah, that was huge. That was a really good scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really- I've, got, I've got to talk to somebody about uh, their paragraph about how um, Will may be asexual. It's like, you need to tweak this paragraph. What were you saying, Nicole? Uh, I was going to say, I really loved the scene between Dustin and Eddie's uncle at the end, you know, beautiful. He, yeah, I, I think I cried harder at that than I did at Eddie's actual death scene. But you see him, you know, removing the, you know, defaced poster and putting up a new one. And I think that gave Eddie's uncle, like, one, it helped give him closure, but also helped him know, like, there was actually people out there that saw Eddie for the good person that he was. Um, and that there was, you know, good people out there because he's just been so demonized by the entire community and i thought that that was a really positive albeit sad scene yeah i i agree i love that scene as well i mean eddie eddie and max are the two of kind of the core stranger things crew they're the ones who get it the hardest and they're also the ones who uh i think had the they started in the lowest point just in terms of like socioeconomic status family status that kind of thing both of them, they are two kids who were born 10 feet behind the starting line. You know, I mean, Eddie's uncle obviously cared for him. But other than that, we everything we see about Eddie indicates that he doesn't have much of a support system. He doesn't have much family. Max has just her mom, who also, on a side note, it occurred to me, that poor woman has been through such unbelievable hell in the last couple of years because she gets married and then her stepson dies. Her husband leaves her and then her daughter is in a coma. So Max's mom, mm-hmm. that poor lady, needs a win as well in her book. It also sounded as though she was spiraling into alcoholism. Yeah. Prior to Max's coma. Yeah, so. which this is definitely not going to help. Mm-mm. I like the scene where um, it's going to be a two-porter um, the connection that I, I had between the two. Uh, I was really proud to see Elle and her being able to navigate Papa and her almost getting to this place where she owned her agency. And at the last where he was seeking out of like this, like he's reaching out and she's just like, nope, sorry. Like I am my own person. You don't control me anymore. And I think from that, the next thing that comes to my mind is when Elle is able to find Max. And when you see Max and she's like alone, and Vecta's there, and it's almost like she's like defeated. And then here comes L, and then you see that kin that kinship between the two of them, and the facial expressions on uh, Max was amazing of being like, "Oh my gosh!" Like I thought I had no way to get out, and here you are, like you're the last person I thought would be here. And that scene like made me so emotional. Like that was so powerful of what we go through with mental health, and having that one person that's safe to us that can guide us out of things. Yeah. Going back to your original question about um, something good, this was just tiny, but um, it just sort of gave me the, the, I don't know, the goosebumps. The first official mention of the internet when they're at Susie's and, and Susie is sort of saving the day with, her navigation of stuff that nobody knows anything about. Um, 
And I don't know, I'm wildly entertained by her. Uh, I hope to see more of her at some point or another. I also, I loved the scene with Will and Mike talking in the van where Will finally mm. shows him the painting and it's kind of, he's, he's pumping up Mike and he's like, you're the heart, you know, you, you keep everybody going, you keep everybody together. It's, it's a beautiful scene uh, because it's one that is, it's a self-sacrifice for Will because he's saying these things that are very much for him. And he's showing this painting that he says L commissioned to commission him to do, which seems very unlikely to me that L would be like, yeah, make a, make a big painting based on your D and D adventures that I was never there for. So from, from what I'm gathering is that it's just Will, you know, it's him saying his true feelings about Mike, everything that he admires and loves about him, and then giving the credit to L so that Mike can feel better in that moment. So it's this beautiful moment of compassion and self-sacrifice from Will. And uh, yeah, it's terrific. I love it. Because Robin seems like she's about to have her girlfriend. We want Will to wind up happy too. <laughs> and Steve, Will and Steve both. Both those two, they deserve. Steve is going to wind up happy. Steve's going to be able to be happy. Steve, he, yeah. Steve's somebody who is totally capable of being happy. Because mm -hmm. now people are pulling for Nancy and Steve to get back together. I want, I want Nancy to just be single. Yes, I agree. I she agree with that too. Dudes. She doesn't need. And also, Steve was saying that lovely idea of like having all these kids and and, and whatnot. And I feel like for Nancy to go along with that runs counter to a speech that Jonathan gave her in the first season where he's like, you know, you're just going to end up with, with someone like Steve and have a bunch of kids out of the cul-de-sac, just like your mom or whatever. Yeah. And then Nancy is growing to show like, she's been, she's so much more than just being limited to doing something because that's her only option. Like she has a lot of options. I want her to go to college. She mm -hmm. needs to go. Yeah. Can we talk just a little bit though about Will, Will's um, still continuing to feel the mind flare and ultimately what that might mean for season five. Can we posit anything about season five? We can guess, of course, it's ultimately, it's, it's whatever they feel like doing. Uh, yeah. I do think um, Will will be one of our ways of getting a confirmation that he's gone, um, finally. Yeah. Because it's will has felt this connection, even though he didn't know what it what he was connected with all this time um he he is a way to feel as like the absence of vecna and a confirmation that you know no matter how dead that villain looks they could come back will might be able to tell us nope oh, he's he's really gone yeah I, I think there's definitely he's going to play a huge role in season five i don't know if anybody else noticed the parallels from like season one and season four when in season one, they say that Will is a sensitive child. And then when they're talking about Henry and the flashbacks are saying he's a sensitive child. Um, there's there's gonna be something there. I don't know what exactly. I, I don't know if it's gonna be that he's gonna be the one to be besides L to defeat Vecna or if maybe he's gonna be a vessel for Vecna. Um, I'm not sure, but I, I definitely feel that there's gonna be some parallels there and he's gonna play a huge role in season five. I agree. Well, we might finally get an answer of why did he latch on to Will of all people? Yeah. Yeah. What were we saying? Yeah. Oh, also, we need to see uh, Elle's uh, adoptive sister seems like kind of the wrong term, but the gal from season two who was who's an, a fellow escapee from the labs as well. Like, the, there's another major plot thread that needs wrapped up. He needs up. to come back. Vecna doesn't know what her powers are either. No, oh, well, which, no, wait, he, he probably would. Uh, because she, because she was already gone from the facility uh, before Vecna got zapped, so she'd been around earlier. But yeah, still might have no reason to think of her. Right. Um, because, but she she Elle could bring her in as a secret weapon. Yeah. Well, because I think that would also fit in with this theme of like that that Vecna stands alone. He only understands the ugly. He doesn't understand things like friendship, cooperation, etc. So, it, in nowhere in his mind would he consider the idea that L would would team up with someone else like that to fight him final thought anybody something you want to get out there you hadn't said i loved it great no okay we're all doing thumbs up there we go yeah <laughs> for sure so where can anybody find each of you uh, on the internet my my 
my uh, clockwise order has changed since I moved my screen around. Uh, when, where can anybody find you or your works? Um, you can look me up on Amazon. Uh, I've got an author profile page there, or you could email me. My last name is Good Friend, so it's just Good Friend at edu.edu. I generally uh, only use social media for my actual real life work. Brent, uh, I am on TikTok. Hopefully, I'll jumpstart soon enough. Um, Twitter and IG with the username the Geek Therapist. Andrea. I'm on Twitter, Andrea France221. Nicole. Uh, you can email me at nicole.k.hassler at gmail.com. Alex. I am at Rocket Llama on Twitter, and my website is rocketlama.com. I am at Superherologist on Twitter. Uh, Dr. Travis Langley on Facebook and Instagram. I think I'm super here all just on TikTok. I'm, just look for Travis Langley. I am easy to find, uh, but the best place to look for me is on the the Amazon uh, book page, uh, where uh, Stranger Things Psychology: Life Upside Down will be out in 2023. It's we, we, we've got other stuff we're working all along the way. One may be a spider themed hero. Who knows? Uh, but uh, thank you all for joining us and bye bye bye. Something. While we're here doing pineapple talk 2022, well, could you, know, you would you on a train? We've got people here who tried it for the first time because of that show, <laughs> and their opinions were split. I am a huge fan, huge fan, always. <laughs> I love pineapple on my pizza. As wind is just shaking your head, <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> it's blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs>